Good morning. morning. That's way better than the first service. They needed more coffee than you guys apparently had. Well, happy Father's Day to the fathers in the room. And um, man, I hope that if you're if you're a father and you're here today, that you don't have to do any chores. I hope that you can eat some bacon or whatever, and um, you know, even maybe build a fire. I feel like that's pretty manly and appropriate for today. Um, But the, the most important thing is that you get to spend time with your church family and with your family this afternoon. Uh, maybe you already have this morning. Uh, well, a month ago on Mother's Day, we talked about Proverbs 31, a Proverbs 31 woman. And today we're going to talk about a Luke 15 father. If you want to turn to Luke 15 this morning, you can or it'll be on the screen. Um, but today the title of my message is The Standard for Fathers. The Standard for Fathers. And, and in Luke 15, we find Jesus, he's teaching a parable, and he's teaching a parable that you probably have heard of. Uh, whether you're involved in church much or not, you've probably heard of the parable of the prodigal son. And often when we preach and teach about um, this story, we, we talk about what? The prodigal son, right? Because that's the story of the prodigal son. Well, today we're going to focus on the prodigal son's Father. We're going to look at this story through a different lens. And the, the father in this story that we're going to read today was chosen to illustrate our heavenly father. And because the father was what he was, the prodigal son became what he should be. And the father was approachable. He was affectionate and loving. And even though he had failures, he walked with God. And his son knew it. So while fathers do have a standard that we'll be looking at this morning in Luke 15, and and that is a part of this message, I will say every Christian can be comforted as we read this story because our heavenly father is even more loving and forgiving than the one in Luke 15 that we're going to look at. Uh, Just as he loved and accepted this prodigal son, he will love and accept us um, when we come for him Uh, to him for forgiveness. Forgive me, I have to use these now. I can't see anymore. Um, Let's look at Luke 15, uh, 11. Shut up. Okay, I'm just kidding. Um, And he said, there's way too many people really enjoying that laugh this morning, I'm just going to say. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, forgive me. Uh, or, Or I mean, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country. And he he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. Verse 17 says, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will against heaven and before, I will uh, arise and go to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, don't miss this, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Verse 25 says, now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked 
what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come home and your father has killed the fattened calf because he received him back safe and sound. The older brother. But he was angry and he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you, I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The story of the prodigal son is one of the most famous stories, one of the most famous parables of Jesus. It, it just beautifully and, and simply portrays the love that God has for his wayward kids. The father represents God in this story and takes center stage by displaying love, by displaying forgiveness, and also wisdom. There's six lessons that I want to bring out of this passage this morning. Six lessons for those of us that want to be great dads. But I will say, if you're in the room and you're not a dad, there are some amazing practical principles for life in here today. So, so listen up, whoever you are. Number one, great dads allow their adult children freedom. In verses 11 through 12, we see that the father gave his younger son half of the inheritance he probably knew he was going to squander it. He probably knew he was going to mess it up. And, but he also recognized that he was an adult. Sad truth is that um, some of the best fathers have to lose their children to the world. They have to watch things that they wish they didn't have to watch. We can't control our children their whole lives. We have to be willing to let them go. There comes a point where we have to be willing to let them go. Bear Reinhardt from the band uh, Wilder Woods, also from, from another band that you may recognize, Need to Breathe, um, wrote a song uh, to sing to his boys. And this song is called Make Your Own Mistakes. And this song is really about um, just the process of realizing he's going to have to let his sons go at some point. And so I love this song, and I just want to share a little bit of it with you this morning. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing. Um, but I do want you to watch this video. Just the first verse and chorus kind of tells the story. So watch this. Last night I could tell that you were listening I could tell that you wish I you were older and it breaks my heart Oh, cause I hope You can find a way of living You can find your own forgiveness So when you fall, don't fall, fall Cause I don't want you to follow me down the same crooked roads to the same old places. I just want you to go your own way. Don't have to chase down the same dreams I did. Heart like yours is hard to break. Go and make your own mistakes. There comes a time when, when fathers, uh, we have to let our kids go. And we have to trust them with God. We have to trust our kids with God and let them make their own mistakes. Number two this morning, um, lessons for those who want to be great dads is great dads let their children, allow their children to live with their consequences. This is a hard one. 
verses 13 through 16, um, really talks about this. One of the, the hardest parts about parenting is allowing our kids to feel the effects of their consequences. And I think that dad, knowing that his kid um, had, had squandered everything, and I mean, I'm sure he was tempted to cook up some steaks and go make a little doggy bag and take it to his son that was in there with the pigs. But he didn't. He waited. I'm sure he prayed. And he, he looked out and waited for his son to come home. Um, love without enabling. He loved without enabling. And sometimes our kids have to hit rock bottom before they even want to come home. And that's hard for parents. That's hard for dads. Number three is that great dads create warm memories of home. That's in verses 17 through 19. Um, When the son was in the pig pen, what did he do? He remembered his father's house. He's like, man, it sure would be nice to be home. It sure would be good to be home. He remembered the kindness of his father. He remembered home. He remembered the goodness of home. And honestly, for everybody, we should want to raise our kids in a way where they feel loved and secure when they're at home. We should raise our kids in a way um, that is healthy. Home shouldn't be a place of yelling. Home shouldn't be a place of rudeness or, or laziness even. Uh, in the day and age we live in, um, should not be a place where mom and dad are just on their phone all the time. My dad really helped my mom to create a good home environment growing up. It was good. It was healthy. And I wanted to be at home. And I remember even as a teenager, my friends wanted to be at my parents' home. It was a good place to be. It was safe. There was love. And then when my parents, or when my, I started having kids, my parents' home was still a place where my kids wanted to be, you know? It was a safe, loving place. And honestly, my parents were pointing my kids to Jesus too. My dad worked hard to make sure that his home was a place of love, and it was a place where everybody had what they need, what they needed. Number four is great dads long to welcome their children home. This is such an important part of the story. The father never quit loving his son. He never quit loving his son. The, The part that just gets me is he was looking for his return. He saw him when he turned the corner and started coming down the driveway. He saw him coming. And what did he do? He ran to him. We can't forget, though, that this story isn't just about the son's reconciliation to the family. It's not um, a story just about the fact that this kid decided to come home for dinner. Jesus is teaching us that he chose to come home to his father. But what he's really saying, he came home. His dad was a, a person that, believed, that had faith. He came home to his dad, but he came to home to the ways of his dad. He came home to God. Dads, we got to remember to welcome our kids home. And the reason why is because God welcomes us home. There's nothing that we could ever do to make God say, "You're you're not welcome home. No matter what, God always welcomes us home. So dads, no matter what, we got to welcome our kids home. I have seven kids, I think maybe three or four of which are in this service, and five boys, and then, and then the two little girls. And I promise you, um, all of my kids have done stupid stuff. No offense. Um, <clears throat> all of my kids have done stupid stuff, but I, I promise you there's nothing that my kids could do where I would just say, you're not welcome home. There's nothing they could do. I'll always love them. I'll always welcome them home. Even if I disagree with them, and even if I think what they're doing is stupid, I'll welcome them home. Number five, great dads forgive their children. Great dads forgive their children. Verses 21 and 24, the son, you you see in this story, the son really repented. He really meant it. He came to his dad, and he repented, and the father forgave him immediately. 
He didn't bring up the money. He didn't bring up the stress that he caused the family. He didn't bring up the fact that, you know, do you realize whenever this son said, hey, I want, I want my inheritance early, what he was saying was so offensive. He was saying, I wish you were dead. I want my inheritance early. Father didn't bring any of that up. What did he do? He ran to him with open arms, forgave him, loved him. Our kids need to know that their father is going to forgive them when they mess up. And, and I will say to this, not just forgive with words, but forgive in their heart. Not holding grudges, not holding things over their heads, but forgive. Why? Because God has forgiven us, right? Right, men? God has forgiven us, so we, can, we got a lot of forgiveness to offer others. Billy Graham said, in one bold stroke, forgiveness obliterates the past and permits us to enter into the land of new beginnings. He also said, Jesus can take the most sin-filled, selfish, evil person and forgive them and give them new life. Then I give you hope? Jesus is always our example in everything and forgiveness is no different. Number six, the last one here is just that great dads minister to each child where they are. Um, kind of the end of this story, we see uh, both of his kids are a part of this story. In verses 25 through 32, the, the older son, man, he'd been faithful. He'd been a good son. He'd been faithful to his father, did what he was supposed to do, loyal. He was so hurt over his father's actions because he was like, that's not fair. That's not fair. He refused to come to the party. He refused to come and celebrate after what this brother of his had done. And we may look at this older brother and, and think, man, what's his problem? Why can't he give grace? Why can't he give forgiveness? What's his deal? But honestly, many times as Christians, we can be the same way. Sometimes we think, well, I'm faithful to God. What's wrong with these people? What's wrong? And we can become entitled. We can become judgmental towards other people that are coming back to Jesus. Ah, they'll never turn it around. They don't deserve God's grace. They're just going to screw it up again. But the father was able to treat his older son in a way that he needed treated, and he treated his younger son in the way that he needed to be treated. And I think it's important for us to see that uh, what, what Jesus is really teaching here as parents, we have to treat our kids as individuals. It's not just one way to parent. Each, each kid is different. We have to parent them uh, with all their uniquenesses. Really, maybe a way to say this is to see them like God sees them. Each kid, individually. Some of you in this room today, hearing this story, if you're honest, you'd have to say, man, I've drifted from my relationship with my heavenly father. And I just want to encourage you this morning, it's time to come home. It's time to come home. Father's arms are, are open wide. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter where you've been. He's coming to you with open arms, ready to forgive you embrace you and give you everything you need to move forward with your life. For other people in this room, it might be salvation. You might be at a place where you're like, man, I know about God. I believe in him. I believe in the Bible, but I do not have a relationship with the God of the universe. I haven't been forgiven of my sins. Man, if I, if I died tonight, I don't have a clue where I would go, but it's probably not heaven. Same thing for you. Come home. Come home to Jesus. It's time to come home. Father's arms are open wide, and they're, they're for daily forgiveness, but they're for ultimate forgiveness of our sins and salvation as well. But there's, there's one more group of people I want to talk to this morning as we're kind of closing this out. And that's the people in the room that have a wall up. Some of you guys, um, because of life, um, because of hurts or different situations, you feel like the safest thing to do is just keep a wall up. Keep a wall up spiritually. 
Maybe you've committed some sin that you're embarrassed of. Or maybe you've, you've done some things that you're like, God could never forgive that. And you don't want to get hurt. And you don't want to connect with God. And I just want to encourage you this morning. God can break down that wall, first of all. And you've never, you haven't done anything that's made you too far gone. You haven't done anything. Just like the story, uh, God has his arms wide open. And he's just like, come home. I forgive you. I accept you. I love you. Let me embrace you. Let me give you everything you need. Come home to Jesus today. Put your pride aside. Don't worry about it. Come home to Jesus today. I want you to imagine this morning um, that there's two boats. One of the boats is in good shape, and the other boat is not in good shape. One of them is sealed perfectly. It's floating great. And the other one's got a bunch of holes in it. And it's, it's going to sink. Now I want you to imagine you got one foot in each boat. you got a foot in the good boat, and you got a foot in the boat that's sinking. Well, if you're here this morning, uh, the boat with holes and leaks, that, that boat is the boat that, that we made that has uh, our sin. That's our sin, man. It, it has created a boat that is going to sink. And then the other boat represents God. And so many people are trying to live a life with a foot in each boat. And I'm just here to tell you this morning, it won't work. That boat that's sinking, is gonna, you're going to fall in the lake. The only way to not fall in the lake, the only way to survive is to have both feet safely planted in the right boat. To have both feet firmly planted in a relationship with God. And so you might be here this morning and you're like, man, I feel that. I feel like I'm all over the place. I believe in God, but I'm not really living for him. And and my sin is bringing me down. I just tell you this morning, man, step over into the boat. Step over into the boat. There's grace. There's forgiveness there. There's the embrace of the Father. Come home. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for this story, this parable of Jesus, and just the picture of your grace and your mercy, your forgiveness. God, I pray if there's anybody in the room today that doesn't know you or maybe they've drifted away from you or maybe they just have a wall up and they just don't want anything to do with it. God, I pray today that you would move in people's hearts. And God, that These people that are far from you this morning in this room, they would come home. God, you would just embrace them, forgive them, and give them new life. Give them a hope. Give them a future. God, we just, we want to sing out to you. We want to respond to to the word this morning. And we we just want to give you everything we have as we worship you, as we pray to you, as we respond this morning. So God, we give you this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.